introduce Ehi Nosahari. Um, she's coming to us from the Microsoft New England Research and Development Center. And in her PhD at MIT, um, she worked on probabilistic latent variable models for like health and well-being. And she's going to talk to us today about um, her experiments in dealing with um, messy data and making um, health-related recommendations. Um, so uh, please welcome Ehi. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Neha, for the introduction. Uh, let me see if I can find. Oh. Yeah. Um, so I'll first like to st I'll like to start off by thanking my um, collaborators. So this was work that was done while I was at MIT. Um, and it's work that came out of the snapshot study, which is uh, um, the study that was run over the course of about it's like three or four years, where we monitored students continuously for 30 days. And we collected objective measures of health, as well as surveys. And um, they were monitored for their sleep patterns. So we're really just trying to figure out you know, what students do. Um, so I'd like to thank the snapshot study team. Um, most of whom are in the Effective Computing Group at MIT and the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Um, and I would also like to specifically thank my um, research collaborators, Sarah, Natasha, Kenny, and my advisor, Rosalind Picard. Um, so to start off here, uh, health is, um, is a, according to the WHO, health is a state of like complete physical and mental well-being and not nearly the absence of disease. Um, and in recent times, there's been a lot more, there's become an increasing focus on promoting mental health and wellness. And even the WHO in 2015, um, as part of their 17 sustainable development goals, um, they wanted to promote mental health and well-being with an emphasis on healthy lifestyles and preventive measures. Um, so pretty much how do we avoid getting into um, this state as opposed to curing once it's already um, happened, for example. Um, so why is this a problem? So mental health is widespread and it's very common. Right now, the WHO estimates that one in four people are currently affected, will, we, will be affected by a mental disorder at some point in their lives. Um, and that's really scary. And um, if you think about it right now, this, um, depression is the leading cause of disability in the world. There's an estimate of about 300 million people currently affected by depression. And the US has a population of about 350. Um, so this is like a lot of people. And unfortunately, more women are affected than men. Um, in the US, 9 million commercially insured people are um, affected by major depressive disorder. Um, and if you look at the average US healthcare cost per person in the US, it's 150% it's more to treat people who have a depression diagnosis compared to like the total population. So this is a problem that's not only affecting people, but is also causing a burden to the US healthcare system. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why we um, sort of focus on this, like how do we keep people who are healthy healthy, and how can we sort of detect the onset of mental, um, mental illness, and you know, what can we do about it? So that's pretty much um, the goal of my lab and the goal of my work. Is that a question? Oh, OK. Um, so thinking about what has been done in the past. Um, recently, there had been an increase in wearable and mobile devices that try to capture um, multimodal data. And they have the potential of identifying risk um, before onset. Um, so there's a lot of classifying or estimating well-being. So can we predict when this person is going to be ill or healthy? Um, but this, as you can imagine, is a very hard problem. Um, there are accuracies that are historically around 55 to 80% for predictive mo uh, models. And the reason for this is mental health is very, very, very subjective. Um, you know, the way I will feel mentally ill would not be the same way um, someone next to me will feel mentally ill. So it's a very subjective um, issue. Um, there have been models who tend to improve, uh, get higher accuracy, typically the neural networks, if you have a lot of data. But they often do not provide insights, right? They just tell you, they're just very good at predicting um, the outcome. But they, you can't really say for a fact, like, why is this, um, why am I getting this, um, this 
prediction, for example. And oftentimes, a lot of the methods have focused on estimating the current state. So how are you feeling right now? Um, and this, this gives you very little room to improve, right? So if I'm telling you, hey, you're feeling stressed right now, it's like, OK. Um, uh, one, what can I do to improve it? Two, you know, maybe I should have known this yesterday, and I could uh, make up for it. Um, so these are sort of like the work, um, some of the research, and some of the approaches used in classifying and estimating well-being. Um, in terms of like investigating um, influences on well-being, here is a little bit more limited. Um, oftentimes, people stop at trying to predict and estimate. Um, but if you want to answer the question of what are the behavioral influences, so giving this prediction, why am I, or maybe not why, but what is contributing to this outcome, this tends to be a lot harder to do, as you can imagine. Um, and people would typically learn associations between single health behavior. So, Let's look at sleep in relation to stress, or let's look at exercise in relation to um, maybe your mood, for example. Um, and they're often always unable to provide personalized recommendations. So they can't really tell you what you need to do in order to improve your mental health, as opposed to saying, oh, on average, in the study, we find like, this correlation between sleep and stress um, in this group of students, for example. So what was our approach? Um, one, we wanted to make sure we were using real world data um, because uh, we figured this is sort of the best way to um, get better at estimating uh, mental health and well-being. And then we wanted to be able to identify objective correlates with self-reported mood, stress, and health. And why we wanted to do this because, um, like I said earlier, this um, mood, stress, health is very subjective. So if we can identify an objective measure that is correlated with this um, subjective report, then maybe we have a better um, chance as going about this. And um, in order to do this, we employ Bayesian modeling. And one, because they're interpretable models, so we can quantify uncertainty. We know some of what these priors mean. Um, and then we predict future mood, stress, and health. So instead of estimating what your current state is, and we try to look at how you will feel tomorrow, given all the information we have about you today. Um, and then we try to study the influence of combinations of behaviors. So given a group of behaviors, how does it affect um, your mental health and well-being? And we try to leverage insights from this model um, to provide relevant, um, or we study how we can leverage insights from this model to provide relevant um, recommendations to individuals. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. Um, I'll be happy to answer. So this talk will be divided into three major sections. The first would be how we predict future um, mood, stress, and health. I'll go a little quicker um, on this part. Um, and then the second part, which is the more recent work, is how we investigate the influence of combinations of behaviors as opposed to um, any one single behavior. And the key to this is, or, or something I want to remind you here, is like for this part of the work, we weren't really trying to optimize for the best predictive model. Um, this is what we did um, in the first part. Um, here, we're just trying to see what groups of behaviors contribute to um, the outcome that we are seeing. And then we try to learn how we can provide evidence-based insights to individuals in order for them to improve um, their mental health and well-being. OK? Uh, yeah. So the first one, um, predicting future mood, stress, and health. So why do we predict, like why did we focus on stress, health, or mood, for example? For one, um, stress really does increase your susceptibility to illness. So the more stressed you are, the more likely you're going to fall sick. Um, and also, the clinicians have told us, and there's been research that shows that self-reported mood is indicative of clinical depression. Um, and it's, um, it has a very strong effect on your longevity or how long you live. And then um, self-reported health actually strongly relates to your health. Um, as an individual. So that's why we focus on these three um, aspects of health. And now to talk a little bit about the data that we use for this work. Um, we, use, we collect data from college students. It's an observational study, like I mentioned earlier. And um, about 104 users, 18, about 1,842 days. We monitor them closely for 30 days. Um, continuous monitoring of their sleep. Um, they fill out surveys in the morning and the evening is telling us about what they do. Um, and then um, the labels and some of the features we collect are things like location patterns, um, where they are outside, indoors, on campus, off campus, 
um, smartphone logs. We don't have content, but we do have timestamps. We know if the calls were missed. We have duration. Um, we also have screen on and off time, so how often you are um, leave, you know, picking up your phone um, or not. Um, and then we also look at information from the weather, because studies have shown, and especially in New England, the weather is really correlated with your mood, <laughs> like today. <laughs> um, and then we also look at some physiological sensors. So electrodermal activity, which research has shown is um, sort of like a proxy for a measure of onset of stress. And um, like I said, they also fill out behavioral surveys. In these surveys, this is where they give us self-reported measures for their mood, their stress, and their health. Um, so it's a scale of 1 to 100. And you know, the lower mean like you're super, super stressed, and 100 mean you're like really calm. And the same for like really sick at zero and like very healthy at 100, and the same for your mood. Yes? Did you develop these surveys? You didn't use like American College Health Association or the like SERP data for prescription? Yeah, so the question was whether we developed the SERP surveys. Yes, we did. Um, so these were our surveys. Um, So the questions were, are these students all computer science students? Yeah, no, they weren't. Um, so these were students that were recruited across um, the university where we did the study in. And it was across different majors, different levels. So all the way freshmen to seniors, male, female. Um, we tried to be as representative as possible to the extent that the university was representative of. Um, so, yeah? Yes, it is. Yes, so we, we try to do personalized models. Um, so we're looking at groups of um, students. And in this, we did discard like the middle 20% of, of a, an individual's mood report. So if you think about reporting mood on a scale of like 0 to 100, for the prediction, in the prediction case, we discarded somewhere around like 40 to um, like 60, like scores that fell within that range because we felt like it was those are high. So if you tell me you're a 50 versus 55, it didn't really matter. But when it's to be able to, me to um, predict if you had really, really low um, mood versus like really, really high. Um, OK. So in order to do this, um, we had two different approaches. And we focused mainly on multitask learning um, because one, we wanted to be able to, and um, multi-site learning is the ability of an algorithm to exploit commonalities between different um, groups of people or different tasks in our case, so that we can share learning across these tasks. Because we definitely can't build models for everyone. We don't have enough data. But then if we can identify similar groups and then you know, share this knowledge across um, the similar groups. And we had two approaches for our multitask learning. One was what we call well-being as tasks. So you're trying to learn the mood, stress, or health of the entire population versus the other approach is use it as tasks. So your model is trying to learn mood for this person or predict mood for this person or stress. You know. So it, you can imagine in the well-being as tasks, we had like maybe three, three tasks. And then use it as tasks, we had about 104 tasks for each of the, each of the um, students. And then for each student, we had three um, prediction objectives. And also, because we were doing future mood, we did have a prediction gap. So we used all of the features up until this evening, and we, we predicted tomorrow evening's label. So the prediction gap of about 20 hours, because we wanted to make sure we were predicting future mood, um, giving all the information we have today. We want to tell you how you will feel tomorrow, because we believe this, gives you actually, this actually gives you the best chance of improving or doing something about it, um, if need be. So the uh, model we use here for this work is the hierarchical Bayesian logistic regression. And um, if you think about this, the each task, given each task M and the model parameters, one is the model learns soft clustering over all the tasks, which is represented by C in the model. Because we, we, we can't use, like I said, we can do um, one model per person. But we wanted to see if we can actually cluster the people and then learn, or cluster the tasks, and then learn. Um, the weights or the parameters over um, these clusters. And then each task or it, each task draws weights from a duration prior. Um, and then um, the conditional probability of 
each task label, which is why is modeled according to that equation. Um, so this is um, the model that we use for, for the work. And then we, we are trying to learn the latent variables, which are shown. And then the parameters are learned using mean field variational inference. So that's the inference algorithm that we use. So given this model, we wanted to have two experiments. Number one, we wanted to show that if we take into account inter-individual variability, which is like differences between individuals, we had significant performance benefits. And then we also wanted to show that these clusters that were learned by the model had meaning. Um, so there was something inherent in um, the population, even though we didn't give that information to the model, the model was learning something um, through the soft clustering approach. So in first, um, taking into account inter-individual inter variability, here is where we compare the two multitask approaches. So when we do well-being as tasks, which is learning or predicting mood over a group of people versus um, in, or groups of individuals as tasks, and to see if there is any performance improvement. So here, the blue is single task learning. So you're pretty much just um, learn, predicting mood on its own versus um, stress of so health on its own. And then in gray, we have the um, well-being as tasks. So it, provides, it doesn't really provide that much of an improvement over um, single task learning case. But when we look at users as tasks, which is where we take into account the inter-individual variability, we do see significant improvement um, over the other approaches. So yes, um, we are, um, you know, this MTL approach is significantly outperforming the other, the other tasks. And that, this is for the accuracy. So we're seeing we're getting an accuracy of all, about 75% compared to less than 60 for the other approaches. And the AUC score as well, that's the area under the curve, we also see a significant improvement of almost, um, of about 0.75 compared to the others. So the other thing we wanted to show was that these learned clusters had um, characteristics that were um, significantly different from the group average. So these clusters weren't just like, you know, let's look for people who are the closest in terms of um, scores, but there are other things. So they were actually varying in um, their, in, in their scores and their reported scores. And here you can see um, the soft clustering that was learned. So soft clustering means every user had some probability of being part of a cluster. But here we rank based on the high, you know, the cluster with your highest probability of membership. And for mood, um, we, we learned four clusters. They are already, they already learned four um, clusters. And then you also see for stress and we see for health. Um, so you can see that the participants are actually um, have like significant memberships in some clusters versus the other. So we were trying to dig a little deeper at the clusters. So here I'm going to be showing examples for the mood clusters. And we wanted to show that it was significantly different. So you had groups. It wasn't just like all the low mood people in one cluster versus all the high mood people. Um, there were like varying um, self-reported scores. So that got us thinking. So what exactly is this clustering um, algorithm learning? And we saw that when we looked at, because we had personality information from the users. And this was, this was not information that was provided to the model. We saw that, for example, cluster one had significantly higher people who had the judging personality or a sense in personality. And people in cluster two, for example, had a higher PSQI score, which is the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. Um, so they had better sleep. Um, and cluster three had people who were significantly um, more agreeable. And cluster four um, had people who were extroverted, you know, had a lot of happy days. So these were personality traits that the model did not train on. But when we compared um, the traits of these individuals versus the traits of each of the individuals in the clusters versus the average of the clusters, um, we realized that these personalities were significantly higher um, than the average. So this is sort of how we you know, say these clusters are representative. Um, OK, that's what I was saying. Yeah, so now we looked at the features that we, um, the model was, of, was trained on. So you can see, so each of the 21 features, like day of the week time on campus, is what you're seeing on the left, and then the clusters. And so we wanted to see the mean feature weights um, in these clusters. So I'm comparing cluster two and cluster three. So for example, cluster two is the high sleep quality cluster, and cluster three is the agreeable cluster. So you can see like they are 
for cluster two, there's like this negative weight that is placed on, um, let's look at the one in the bottom, um, you know, texting anywhere from 5 p.m. to midnight. And um, you also have like a negative weight on like um, pre-sleep personal interaction. So again, these are people who had a high sleep quality index. So chances are they were actually sleeping. So they weren't really interacting with people. On the other hand, the people who had significantly agreeable um, traits Ha placed positive weights on um, pre-sleep interaction and um, communication at night or going towards midnight. So here we see that the clusters are actually learning something um, based on the um, features that the model has. And these are, um, these are things that weren't really fed to the model. The model did not see this. Um, so it got us really curious. So well, in summary, we're able to predict future well-being of participants in a study we demonstrated like statistically significant differences um, of, um, given personalization approaches. And then um, we, this showed us that it was important to account for inter-individual differences. So if you're, if you're trying to look for mental health and well-being because it's so subjective, you actually want to um, be a little bit more fine-grained in your approach. Um, so don't just predict the well-being of an entire population. And then we saw um, relevant relationships between input features and pers participant personality traits. So this got us really curious. One was whenever we presented this work, people would often ask us, OK, so now that you've predicted I'm going to be happy or sad or stressed, what do I do about it? And we're like, um, we don't really know. <laughs> so it got us really curious. Like, what can we actually do about it? Um, and given the differences we saw in the clusters, can we actually start to tease, about, tease apart like, sort of the behavior, like what are the behavioral influences on um, well-being or mental health? Yes? Oh, yeah. So the, it was, it's a non-parametric algorithm, so we actually don't define the clusters. So we end up like just trimming clusters that had less than epsilon. Um, the question was, did we explore a different number of clusters? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yes? Yes, they are. Yes. So for this particular approach, you, um, you can't. But there is an extension of this algorithm where you can train on previously unseen um, individuals. Um, we just didn't go down this, this path at the time. Because one, we didn't have data of like, previously unseen individuals. But yeah, but the algorithm can be extended to in include that case. Um, the question was if we could uh, predict on previously unseen individuals. OK. So again, um, like I said, we got really curious. Like, how do we investigate um, combinations of behaviors? And we didn't want to just look at one thing, right? So maybe sleep or stress. We wanted to look like, like because we believe that it's not just one thing that affects you, right? It's either maybe because you, you, know, you had a bad argument, and then you slept late, and then you have an exam the following morning. Like, it's typically a combination of um, things that would result in some outcome. So we didn't want to try to isolate um, these behaviors. So it got us thinking. First, why was this relevant? Um, so we do, there, it's been well known that your um, daily behavior, so every, the things you do um, on a day-to-day -day basis actually does affect um, your well-being. And um, so the thing is, like, we really wanted to focus on um, interpretable models. So like, why am I, we're trying to answer the question for why. So why are we seeing this outcome? Why are we getting? this stress prediction or um, this low mood prediction? What mood of behavior has influenced this outcome? Um, and then we also wanted to be able to, like whatever we do, provide actionable insights. So instead of just telling people, hey, we think it's because you didn't sleep or because you drank coffee yesterday, that's why you feel this way. We wanted to see if there was a way to, you know, to tell them what they could do. Um, now, that's a much harder problem, but we're, just, we're trying to see if if we could at least um, think through how this could be approached. Um, so again, we use data from the, yes? Uh, can you give some example of that? Uh, so that will be at the, end, at the end of the talk, yeah. So I would first answer how we learned the groups of behaviors, and then I will show you how we do actionable insights, yes. So 
So these are college students. So they're typically within the age of like 18 and 22. So there isn't much. So we couldn't really consider age because they're very close in age. But yes, age definitely matters. <coughs> For the first part of the study? Yes. Oh, I don't think I mentioned this. But initially, we had like feature engineered about 348 features. At that point, we weren't discarding them. We did dimensionality reduction um, and you know, analysis of a variance. And that sort of helped us select the features that were most important um, for, the, for the prediction work. So it resulted in about 21 out of 350. Okay. The question was, how do we select features? Again, so in, for this part of the study, because we're really trying to understand um, sort of what groups of behaviors, we wanted to focus on modifiable behaviors. So again, we didn't look at all the data that was available to us. Here, we made this executive decision that we were only going to look at things that people can actually change. Um, so keeping that in mind, um, this is not like trying to get the next and the best prediction accuracy. This was just trying to understand um, what could potentially be affecting this outcome that we were seeing. Um, so we, again, looked at smartphone logs, um, location patterns. Um, and then we looked at behavioral surveys, you know, as in the first study, but focusing on, you know, again, modifiable behaviors. And then we used the wearable sensors for sleep monitoring, because we really wanted to understand their sleep patterns, for example. <coughs> so again, like, this is very messy data. Um, and for, you know, to get the, we also wanted this to be interpretable. We're trying to figure out how do we go from this data to something that this, the models will actually use and be able to give us results that we can interpret in an intelligible way. Um, <clears throat> so here we borrowed a little bit from the NLP um, literature. And we decided to, um, sort of like, uh, similar to the bag of words, we decided to do a bag of behaviors uh, analogy. Um, so for example, these are like examples of behaviors in a participant's day. Um, so you look at like, you know, five outgoing calls, they didn't text anybody, um, they worked out for an hour. So these are sort of things that would be contained in the survey and um, the monitoring that we did. Um, and the first thing we did was um, we wanted to make sure we were capturing how they were working together. So we, we chunked the behaviors, right? Because if, if you maybe made two calls versus if you made 15 calls in a day, um, these were very different behaviors, especially if maybe you had never made 15 calls before. That could signal some like stress or something, I don't know, happiness. Um, and so we, for each of these behaviors, we, we looked at the distribution over all the features, and then we tried to chunk based on the population that we had. We also wanted to record when a behavior was absent. So if you did not text today at all, um, we wanted to make sure we could capture that um, as well. And then um, a couple of things we wanted to investigate was if, because we, we do know, right, it's not just what you did today, but sometimes what you do the day before. Um, what did they the day before? <laughs> that could affect how you feel today. So we wanted to test out this um, hypothesis um, because we really couldn't do any time-based modeling because we didn't have enough data. And so we included features such as sleep duration tonight and then your sleep duration the previous night. And again, this was um, chunked. So like maybe six to seven hours was a different behavior from not even sleeping at all or sleeping for one to two hours in a day. Um, and we for sleep, yes? No, so like if you think about uh, today's Thursday, so you just woke up. So Wednesday night into Thursday morning was your sleep duration for today. Um, so we did sleep duration today, sleep duration the previous night, and sleep duration the previous, previous night. Um, we really wanted to investigate sleep. I like sleep. <laughs> and then um, we also wanted to look at the bedtime. Um, so when you went to bed. Um, and the way we would do it is for each of these, so we would, so just like bag of words, we wanted to see if this was um, present. So it was a combination of about, it was one to zero, so one hot encoded. Um, if these behaviors were present in your day. Um, and that led us to about 134 behaviors that we looked at. Um, about almost over 5,000 days of data, 100,000 observations, and 
This was all collected from 224 unique participants. Um, and again, we modeled these days individually um, because we didn't have enough data to do anything that would be more complicated. So again, um, we borrowed from the NLP literature and we're looking at latent Dirichlet allocation or variant to LDA. Um, I'm guessing um, a lot of you are familiar with LDA, but just a brief um, description of what it is. If you have documents in your model, you are trying to learn topics or which are distribution over words in your documents. Um, and the idea is giving several many documents, um, there are certain topics that um, describe these documents and you want to see what these topics are over you know, a fixed number of documents. And um, each topic is a distribution over words and a document is a mixture of topics. And each word is drawn from each topic. So that's sort of what the LDA um, model does. And ultimately, you learn um, the latent topics, which are things you don't observe. And then you also learn personalized topic proportions over the documents. And you learn topic assignments for each word. So now, this is the vanilla LDA. Um, but what we, um, but there is something called a supervised, yes? Absolutely. Yeah, so the thing was, this study was only over 30 days. So we, and it was 30 days at the beginning of uh, the semester. So we didn't really, it was hard to do that for just that, because typically the first month is you know, the least stressful part of a semester. We did do a longer study um, where we looked at the entire semester. And that one, yes, we did see um, patterns like across weekends, but there were only 20 students. Like these things are really expensive. It's like almost a thousand dollars per student. Um, yeah. Absolutely. It's very possible. Yeah. So this that's that's one of the limitations in the study, and it's something we talk about. Um, you you know, our biggest limitation is availability of data. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I will talk about how we borrow from LDA in a second, but I just wanted to make sure at least the understanding of the models were clear. Um, that's a good question. So in the supervised um, LDA approach, if you think about just summarizing, you're learning latent topics, and there could be several different combinations of latent topics. But what the supervised LDA does is it tries to tie, <clears throat> it tries to find these topics that are um, inherently tied to some response variable. So if you think about movie ratings, for example, and I'll, I'll tell you why this is relevant, but if you think about movie ratings, for example, um, instead of just summarizing topics over ratings, you probably, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you probably want to summarize topics in such a way that they are constraints that you know, hey, this is a high review versus this is a low review versus this is a five or this is a zero score. And what it does is there's this joint modeling that happens between finding the topics and regressing these topics over the response variable. So if you think about using the topics you've learned in the LDA, and then using that as features in a, regress, in a regression model, that's sort of this two-step approach that it does in one. Um, so in this way, it constrains the model such that the topics that I learned are um, predictive or are predictive of this response that you want. So why is this important for us? In our case, we say the words are the modifiable behaviors. Um, and each document is a day. Um, so if you think about the, word, the behaviors in your day sort of make up this document. And the response variable in this case is self-reported stress. So we focus, we, we, do the, we do this analysis over stress, mood, and health. But the purposes of this talk, I would only focus on the stress results. Um, and so the, the response variable is the self-reported stress. And the latent topics are these latent patterns, right, which are probability distributions over behaviors, so combinations of behaviors. So what we believe or what we were trying to test was there are this, you know, latent patterns of behaviors that sort of govern our day. And if we can learn this, we would, sort, we would know how, especially since these topics are tied to um, stress, they are, they are predictive of stress, then we can look at these topics and how they correlate with the stress response variables and hopefully understand 
um, what sets of behaviors contribute to you know, low stress versus high stress. Um, so this is um, sort of the framework that we use. Are there any questions? Okay, great. So there were three experiments that we wanted to go through. One was we wanted to show that these latent patterns are indeed predictive of self-reported stress, because this was important, right? Because if we were just learning any group of uh, patterns, then you know, we could learn whatever. But we wanted to make sure we we're constraining the model to learn patterns that were predictive of stress. Um, so we wanted to show first that these patterns were, um, were predictive of stress when compared to patterns learned in an unsupervised way. And then we also wanted to show, so you know, there was always this question of why can't we just use something simpler like, you know, I don't know, L1 regularized regression. So like just get all these features and regress them over the response variables since L1 does inherent um, feature selection for you, maybe you would get some information. So we wanted to show that this model actually outperforms the lasso as well. And then show that these patterns were actually are, are um, meaningful combinations of health behaviors. So first, um, so in order to do this, what we do is um, here we um, have it's a five-fold cross-validation. So you train on four, predict the the, four, um, the fifth fold, and what we're what you're seeing here is the results of um, the and for, so because we wanted to look at predictive accuracy, we have like bind, we split the regression. So we're learning or we're trying to predict. Like, it's a regression, but then if you're less than 50, we take that as a zero. If you're higher than 50, we take that as a one. And we try to see what the accuracy is for each of these models. Um, and here is the results from the vanilla LDA over 20 topics. Um, and we see, like, this is pretty much as bad as actually doing worse than a random um, prediction. So these topics that are not learned in a supervised way really don't have any um, bearing over the self-reported stress. However, if you do use the supervised LDA uh, approach, which is this whole notion of tying your topics to be predictive of stress, you do get a significant improvement in the prediction accuracy of, um, of these topics. So yeah, because um, if you think about it, like these are relatively healthy individuals, and there are several many options or patterns or combination of behaviors that you can learn. But we did want to make sure we were learning combination of behaviors that were best predictive of stress. Um, and here's the F1 score as well. Um, still significant differences in the, um, I guess, in both of these models. Any questions? Okay. Um, the second thing we wanted to show was that the um, model outperformed the L1 um, regularized regression. Um, and the reason we do this was because we wanted to see how well we were doing. Was it even necessary to go down this super complicated route? Um, and yes, indeed, um, there were some significant differences um, between um, the performance of the um, LDA and the uh, Lasso regression. It does give us some improvement in predictive accuracy and as well as F1 score. So it was better at predicting um, the true values. But we were curious um, because um, the Lasso coefficients, or at least the L1 regularized model, gives you um, some and so this is sort of where you know, using interpretable, interpretable models were important for us, because we wanted to know what exactly are these behaviors, for example, that are leading to positive versus negative outcome. And we started out at looking at the coefficients that the lasso model learned and seeing how they related to our features. So here are the regression coefficients. And then if you think about it, like 100 was like really happy um, or really calm since this is stress. And then zero was like, um, really stressed. So your um, positive coefficients are positive correlated with um, being really calm and negative coefficients are negative correlated without outcome variable. So low is bad, high is good. So here you see negative interaction as being one of the very, um, one, of the, one of the behaviors that were negatively correlated with calm. And then if you look at on the other end of the scale was positive interaction. And this was really interesting because, I mean, it's common sense <laughs> that, you know, if you're having negative interactions with people, you will be stressed. Um, of course, depending on the degree of negativity. Um, but it was interesting to see that the models actually did capture um, this as well. Um, another thing that we saw was this notion of sleep regularity. 
So oftentimes, or at least um, up until recently, there had always been this recommendation of sleep for eight hours a day, or um, all you need to do is sleep for seven hours a day. But one thing we had studied early on in our group was to see, was this notion of sleep regularity. So are you sleeping consistently at the same time every day? And how does that affect your health? And we found that, that when you actually control for sleep duration, sleep regularity um, was very important for your health. So it's not just enough to sleep for eight hours a day, but making sure you're going consistently to bed at that point. So if you're sleeping at 1 a.m. today and then tomorrow 5 p.m., next tomorrow like 3 p.m., like that's really not good for you. And the module actually captured this. And so the sleep regularity score is, think about it as a, as a correlation between the different days that you go to bed and then an average over those. Zero was like you were a really irregular sleeper. And one was like you were super consistent. Like, you know, you slept at 10 p.m. to 5 p.m. 5 a.m., hopefully not 5 p.m. 5 a.m. every day. Um, so here, are the, one of the worst um, um, behaviors in the model was a, like a sleep regularity of 0 to 0 0.4. Um, and then there's another one of like 0 0.4 to 0 0.5. But then as the coefficients become more uh, positively correlated with calm, you have a sleep regularity of like 0 0.8 to 0 0.9. So this was one of the um, situations where our um, sort of like what we thought was like common sense mat you know, was matching exactly the outputs of this model. So it was very encouraging. Again, so this was the L1 regularized regression, and we're really just curious to see if we're on the right track. Any questions? Um, <laughs> I should say this, but the um, alcohol consumption gave us really good grief. <laughs> we tried so hard. Um, but again, just a disclaimer, I, sh I always have to say this. We did not have um, consumption, con so we didn't know how much was consumed. Uh, we only knew it was consumed. <laughs> and um, the other thing was when we, because my advice actually really made me dig through this. Um, it, uh, more, more often, it was reported that they were consuming alcohol over the weekends. And weekends are typically you know, less stress fee days. So it's not clear what direction this is going. Um, so this is not proof of anything. <laughs> um, so the third experiment we did um, was that um, we wanted to show that. So back to our SLDA model, we wanted to show that we actually uncovered um, meaningful latent patterns. Um, yeah. Um, so what, one thing that we were thinking of, and, I, and that's sort of why we went through this particular approach, was looking at combinations of behaviors. Because what those topics are are probability distributions over words. So it looks at how all these things um, affect this outcome, as opposed to the last so where it's looking at it as one feature at a time. Yeah, that's sort of, well, yes. No. There's no causality. Yeah, it's very possible. And again, a lot of, I mean, a lot of the work we do, especially with prediction, is also um, correlation, right? Uh, but, you know, it's, it's hard to do causality, especially in a study like this. Um, our cities are very expensive. <laughs> Would you volunteer for that study? <laughs> I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> I don't think that's ethical. <laughs> Like, let's keep this really stressed student stressed. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so that's the problem, right? Like, there are just some studies you cannot ethically do. So you make do with what you have, which is correlation. <laughs> um, yeah, so we wanted to show that these patterns were uh, meaningful. And we wanted to you know, stress that this combination of behaviors was what was important. So this is like a super. Um, I'll try to explain this. So if you think about, these are the highly probably wor probable words. So this is an 11 topic L um, SLDA. 11 to 12 topics give us the highest predictive accuracy. Um, so we chose 11. So if you think about this, the topics from the bottom are um, positively correlated with stress. So these are like um, negative topics. Think about it this way. And as you go higher and higher to the top, the very top, you have these positive topics, right? 
So each of these topics, you have the most probable words. And there are, think about nine, or behaviors. I think there are about nine of this, um, from the most probable to the least probable. But of course, the entire set of behaviors are represented. Um, so if we look at the negative um, topic, which is like most correlated with stress, let's see some of the behaviors that were identified by the model. So no exercise, for example, um, having caffeine con consumption, negative interaction, studying for four to six hours, um, <laughs> study, <laughs> um, but it is stressful. <laughs> um, and then if we look at the topic which is like most possibly correlated with calm, so like the calmest topic, for example. Um, so you see things like sleep regularity was highly um, expressed, like 0 0.8 to 0 0.9. Again, we see this notion of sleeping for 78 hours the day before and sleeping for 78 hours today, or the night, sorry, the two nights before and the night before. Um, and of course, there was like no time spent on campus. <laughs> yes? Yeah, it's very possible. Um, that it could just be a weekend. But it, I, I think what this shows is like at least those behaviors that we express on the weekends are the healthy behaviors, because we do have the time um, to do that. It's, it's very possible. Um, uh, I didn't get your question. So, so you said seven factors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would that in the um, it is possible. Yeah, it is very possible, yes. Um, so then the next topic here, we look at things like uh, the average bedtime was going to bed at midnight and 1 a.m. Um, and then again, longer sleep duration, pre-sleep interaction, media, which could be entertainment. Um, and so the topics are actually learning or at least this, this, as they become more and more correlated with, positively correlated with stress, they're actually learning some information, um, like we see. And so things like sleep regularity, for example, increase as these topics become uh, you know, more correlated with, um, with being calm. Um, yeah, yes. Well, on average, um, it was bedtime at 12 to 1 a.m. Um, but we found that most people were going to bed a lot later. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, yeah. So again, looking at the, so again, we saw that each, so if you think about back to our analogy, each day is a distribution over different topics, right? Um, and so we wanted to see the patterns that were expressed on each day. So if you look at, these are participants. So we divided the participants into like high calm, mid calm, to high stress people. And we randomly selected 50 people in each of these buckets and we ordered it. So this being the most calm pattern was expressed um, more predominantly in individuals who had um, high calm scores or individual days, because each of these are participant days. Um, and same for stress, but in the middle it was like really um, up for grabs. Um, so yes indeed, like there are some meaningful um, patterns that, that are being learned. Um, in the, from the model. So in summary, um, this was a, 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 like a normal framework, like how do we map multimodal data to meaningful representations of health behavior? Um, and then we demonstrated how this, that these patterns are actually useful in predicting well-being, um, creating personalized insights to individual days, and um, we learned associations between self-reported stress and objective correlates of, um, and behaviors that can actually be measured objectively. Which, were our, which was our goal for this study. Um, so finally, for the last part, I would like to show how this could potentially be used for actionable insights. Again, a disclaimer, this, you know, we would need to do like a large scale study to verify any of this, um, but just you know, thoughts like how could this possibly be done, um, given all the information that we have. Um, so first, remember that um, what the model was learning was personalized probability distributions over this pattern, right? So we do have a probability distribution over your day. Um, so the framework that we thought about that could potentially be useful 
was, um, and if you, if you have a, given a trained model, you can learn what these topic expressions would be in an unseen day. You have this model that has learned all of these patterns, then you can sort of predict what the topic proportions would be for this data you have not yet seen. So imagine if we have this model and an unseen day, we can predict the expected stress of um, a person, so what the expected stress would be tomorrow of this new day that we haven't seen. And then, because these are probability, we inherently get probability distributions um, over this day, we can find similar days that the model had seen be before using like some probability distance. So what was the closest distance between what the model had been trained on and what I have not yet seen? And then we can look at the behaviors. And so in this case, we constrain the model, right? So give me the closest day to my probability distribution but had higher scores, for example. Um, and then we can look at the behaviors that were in this, um, previously seen day and try to see if there are differences and recommend that to this person. Again, this is just an idea. Um, so it's a case study to see how this would really work. So this is a participant that had very high stress. Um, so for like 13, 13 days, so we trained the model up until 13, um, like 13 days. I can see four days are in the calm and about nine days are in the stress. And this person has, I think, an average score of about 55. Um, over the 13 days. So now we, we're trying to figure out what the score would be for the 14th day. Um, and so we predict this, we get a probability distribution, and then we try to do this distance, like what are the closest days? So we found the two closest days to participant A. So participant A, a had a predicted score of like 21. And then the two closest days are like 194. The two closest better days are 194. And we're trying to see what, you know, what sort of things can we recommend for example. So one, we see like a bedtime of, you know, going to bed one hour earlier, for example, being a difference between this and this other participant. There's another like of sleep duration. So this person only went to bed for four hours, you know, the next best person went to bed for like six to seven. Um, and, you know, there was no social, almost no reported social interaction. And, you know, this happy people who were closer to them had social interaction. Um, and again, there was like a negative, And then that probability distribution had a positive behavior. Um, so given this sort of similarities, um, we can, you know, predict, we can, um, we can recommend, you know, going to bed an hour earlier, sleep longer, uh, more social interactions, avoid negative interactions. So we wanted to see if there, was, if there was even any benefit in doing this. Uh, so we looked at the past sleep behaviors. So sort of like the previous uh, 13 days. And we saw that when the participant, so this is the actual participant we're trying to recommend behaviors for. When they um, recommend a bedtime of like two to three, which is, a lot, which is like two hours earlier than what was currently reported, they had a very high calm score. And then also when they had a sleep duration of like eight to 10, they also had a high um, calm score as well. Um, so it's not really far-fetched to recommend better sleep or better sleep patterns for this individual. The other was more social interactions. Again, um, when they had um, outgoing calls or um, SMS, they also reported very high calm scores. So there is some correlation between some of the behaviors that we could possibly rec recommend and like a higher behavior score for this individual. Um, again, this is like a very rough sketch of what we could possibly do or how we could get um, actionable insights. Um, given the behaviors and the topics that have been learned. Um, so in summary, um, we used the jensen shannon distance and we were able to sort of like sketch out some framework that we can make of a personalized recommendation. Um, we can recommend behaviors from better calm days. Um, and then, we def like I said, we definitely need to be able to validate this um, using a more extensive study and to see how that would work. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, so this is something that we um, really focus on in my group, um, or my former group when I was at MIT. Um, oftentimes, there's a, there's a lot of work um, done to um, sort of how do we help people who are ill. So there's a lot of research on heart disease, cancer, which I think is really great. But there's not that much of a focus on how do we keep healthy people healthy. Um, there's a greater population of healthy people. And this is a lot harder, too, because it's hard to collect data. I mean, we have wearable devices now who help with that. But oftentimes, by the time you get to the doctor, you are already sick. Um, so we believe that there are people who, you know, 
you know, especially if you start out a semester together, usually start out, everyone is happy, you just had a holiday, um, things are going well, but then something happened, right? You get a bad score from your test or, you know, a breakup, whatever. Um, and then there are people who are resilient and are able to sort of bounce back, but there are some people who are vulnerable and, you know, they go down the decline. And unfortunately, oftentimes, mental health care comes in around here when you're already vulnerable and you've already gone down this steep decline. Um, what we try to focus on is in that intersection right there. Can we figure out what these things are? Like, how do we help people such that they're able to bounce back um, before, we, um, before it's too late or before you know, it, it becomes like really a, um, a serious problem? So these are some of the things that we, um, I spent a lot of my time thinking about while I was a grad student. It's not a very easy problem because one, there's not enough data for it. Um, the measures are very subjective. Uh, mental health is still a stigma. People shy away from um, talking about issues like this. So it makes it a very challenging problem. But there is hope. Um, and we be, do believe that there are ways we can continue to do this work such that um, before people get to the point where they are, um, where it's a little late for some people, we can help out with looking at behaviors and how they influence your day. Um, so on that note, um, just to summarize, I talked about predicting future mood, stress, and health um, through personalized MTL approaches. Um, I also showed how we investigate um, combinations of behaviors on well-being using um, efficient representations of um, health behaviors and supervised topic models. And we did a case study, or I showed a case study of how we could possibly uh, make evidence-based recommendations to individuals um, using the behavioral probability distributions that were learned from, this, um, from the topic model. Um, so yeah, um, if you have any questions. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Not that I'm aware of. But yes, you're absolutely right. That's an approach that you can do. I agree. <laughs> and I think that's also one of the things um, with the combination of behaviors that we're looking at. I didn't spend too much time on the patterns because we didn't have any time. But then if you looked at closely at those patterns, there were some behaviors, even in the, even in the most positive correlated topics, there were some negative behaviors and there were some positive behaviors. So um, you know, it's, it's not realistic to expect that you're going to be like 100% all the time. And that's why we look at a combination, because there, we believe that there is this compensatory effect. right? So maybe you had a very stressful day, but you slept well, and you ate well, and you exercised, even though you got into an argument. Um, but, and, so it's, and that's why we didn't look at behaviors in and of themselves, because there's definitely some compensation that needs to happen, um, because you know, life you know, really has to happen. Sure. No, so it was 30 days consistent, like, uh, very, like a consistent set of 30 days at the beginning of the semester. And they were monitored continuously for about at, at most, at least 22 hours out of those 24 hours. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so th th then again, one of the biggest limitations of this study that it was done with college students, um, that's the data that we have. Of course, you know, you can, number one, college students are easy to recruit for studies like this um, because they will, you know, they get paid for it and money's always good <laughs> when you're an undergrad. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Real world data, sure. If we have it, we will use it. Unfortunately, this is it because it's HIPAA protected because we collected it with the hospital. Um, yeah.
Yeah, so w this work, what we did was um, we predicted in the future, given behavior. So those self-reported charts weren't actually things the models were trained on. Those were the labels. So assuming you had a history of um, behaviors, given this trade model, you can predict what the lab report would be in the future. And then one thing to note, though, is in like psychology, Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And self-report is the gold standard. And um, like if you speak to like doctors, so it's being good. Yes. Yes, two, t twice a day. Hmm. That's interesting. We didn't actually look at it, but I, I can imagine that there will be some effect. I'm assuming that we're actually mindful. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, did you try simulating some data from the models that you learned? We didn't. But for the second model, is a generative model, so you could? Yeah, but we did not. So your question was if we had individuals with similar features but different um, ha like happiness scores. Yeah, that, that's bound to happen. Because again, these are very subjective measures. So it's, you know, I could sleep eight hours and still be very angry. <coughs> Tomorrow, you know, it might be enough for someone. So yes, that's possible. But we didn't really look into that because that was not the goal of the study. Yeah. Yes. Both. So we had them report both in the morning and in the evening. And so for this study, we read so the results I presented were evening scores. Yeah. Yes. No, we didn't. Not in the study. Um, so we didn't actually recommend to individuals. Uh, but this, this was a case study to show how you could possibly do it. Yes. Yeah. You said there was some way to like uh, extend this model to like then generate new data for Absolutely. Like, previously unseen people. Like, so how yeah. do you do that? Uh, we can take that offline because that's a complicated approach. Yes. Yeah, on that note, let's thank oh. Eddie for this talk. Um, <laughs> you'll be around for like an hour or so, so people yes. can still ask you questions. Okay. Just